Mmh. Bonjour. Merci d'être venu. OK. So, I will try to have a class, make a class that's not as disastrous as last time. So, so today we are going to uh, talk about Fermi liquid the theory, which is sort of, uh, if you want, the foundation of solid state physics in some sense. I mean, uh, okay, okay, there's a bed structure and so on, but uh, why is it that the electrons behave as if they were almost free, despite the fact there are strong interactions? So this would be part of the answer. I mean, the, there would be more coming later, but uh, it will be a part of the answer. So I will start by talking about quasi-particles in the sense that uh, we have seen the results of uh, angle result photoemission experiment. And there were peaks that were dispersing and they were becoming sharper as we get, as we get close to the Fermi surface. So we'll just uh, proceed phenomenologically at this point and find the necessary condition for this concept to be valid. And then in Fermi liquid, we will go a little bit deeper and see uh, that uh, this is uh, satisfied. And I will end up with the discussion here of the momentum uh, distribution, which is uh, just uh, that the, even uh, despite the fact that there are interactions, at zero temperature, the Fermi surface is a well-defined concept. There's a jump in the momentum distribution. And that uh, jump as a function of wave vector is the Fermi surface. And we will see that despite interaction, the Fermi surface still uh, exists. Okay. Uh, so do you have any questions? Okay, so let us uh, 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 let us start. See, I, I just want to say that this this will be the uh, sort of the there will be more formal matters, but this is sort of the uh, end of the for formal matters. And uh, next week we will start with the Coulomb gas, and we will still need to work out a little bit the tools to be able to, to do the calculations. But we will start to see how perturbation theory works. How, how we can um, how we can look at the electron gas. So uh, what was measured in the experiments I showed you was the angle in the angle result photoemission experiment was the spectral width, and which is related to the imaginary part of the Green's function. And we said that the Green's function, uh, quite generally, G R G retarded of k and uh, omega can be related as okay, uh, written as one over uh, omega plus uh, i eta minus uh, zeta k. So zeta k is epsilon k minus mu if you want. And then minus uh, sigma ret retarded of k and omega. Okay. And as omega goes to infinity, it goes like one over omega. And the one here is, uh, is necessary, it's related to the anti-commutation relation of operator. So the spectral weight is the imaginary part of this. So let's write the imaginary part. So the imaginary part, let's first write, I will just to make, uh, to have a shorthand, I will write uh, sigma retarded of uh, K and uh, omega. I will write as a sigma prime to the real part of k and omega <coughs> plus i times a sigma double prime of k and omega. So that's just the imaginary part. Now the spectral weight uh, a of a k and omega is the imaginary part of this. So I just multiply numerator and denominator by, by the imaginary part, uh, by, by the complex conjugate, sorry, uh, bad start. <laughs> so, so what happens is that the, if I look just at the imaginary part, okay, the denominator, let me drop the i eta because uh, we will have some, uh, some imaginary part here from the self energy anyway. So let me drop the, uh, the i eta, and then I will have uh, omega minus zeta k minus uh, sigma prime 
of t and omega. Everything square plus sigma double prime of k and omega square. And in the numerator, I will have minus. Uh, so a of k and omega was min was uh, was um, twice the imaginary part. So because I use the complex conjugate here, I have the minus sign that comes in, and I have the two that's in the definition, and I have the sigma double prime of k and omega. Okay. That's just multiplying this by a complex conjugate in the numerator and uh, taking the imaginary part. Okay, now this quantity is positive. It can be interpreted as a, within factor of two pi can be interpreted as a probability. So is it positive? I mean, what about this minus sign? Eh? Is it related to the dissipation being a negative? Yeah, it's related to causality. Uh, and the, or the, uh, so you see, well, I need plus i eta here. So it means that the imaginary part of sigma has to be negative if I want to have the poles in the correct complex plane. OK? So sigma double prime is always negative. And this definition is very standard. I mean. There are many things that vary from one book to the other, and the notation is a nightmare in general, but th this notation is universal. I don't know any exception. Uh, for A of k and omega, there are exceptions. I mean, I, I, use, I always do integral d omega over 2 pi, but if you just do integral d omega, then there is a 1 over pi here. Okay, so you divide by 2 pi, the 2 disappears, and you get 1 over pi. <clears throat> Okay, so now you remember that there was a there was a bump, and that we saw that the uh, quasi particles, I mean these bumps that we call quasi particles, were becoming narrower as we get closer to the Fermi surface. So you see that if this is small enough, then small enough we will define. But uh, now if this is a small enough. Uh, then there's this uh, function looks like a, like a Lorentzian that is uh, peaked. Huh? The Lorentzian is the width is here, and the position of the Lorentzian is here. Okay. So uh, let the peak of the Lorentzian will be where this quantity is zero. So you say I have to solve for omega because omega is is uh, is here as well. So let, 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 now let me ex, let me suppose that there's a solution for and expand around the solution for omega equals zero. So it means that I will uh, write uh, omega minus uh, zeta k minus uh, sigma prime of uh, k and omega is okay. Now about I I expand around the solution where this is zero. So I get the zero. Then I get the, the, the first derivative with respect to omega. So it will be d, d omega. Okay, I'm assuming that the solution exists for omega equals zero. <coughs> and the d d omega of uh, omega, that doesn't depend on of omega, minus uh, sigma prime of the k and omega. And so that's the first order in the Taylor series. So I get omega minus <coughs> the solution of this equation equals zero. And the solution of this equals zero, I will call uh, Ek minus mu. Okay, like these are my new particles. You see what I mean? Wherever this is a zero, I get the Ek I, I call that solution e k minus mu, and the solution will depend on wave vector u g. But I assume that for each wave vector, there's only one solution, and the solution I call e k minus mu. 
so that's right. So omega equals zero, it looks like the usual, usual thing. Okay, so now it means that I can rewrite uh, this object uh, as uh, follows. I can write a of the k and omega equals um, I will I this uh, two pi I am adding now and I'm taking away immediately <laughs> one over pi and this uh, two is this uh, two there one over pi so and here I have uh, minus uh, sigma double prime of k and omega and in, in the denominator <coughs> I have um, I have uh, this quantity. <coughs> so this is evaluated. I, I forgot to say that. I mean, that's a Taylor expansion. So that's evaluated at omega equal e k minus e. Okay. <coughs> um, so let me uh, define this uh, quantity. So I will define uh, z of k by definition is our z k to the minus one, if you want, is equal to uh, one, so that's this first derivative, minus the uh, sigma prime of k and omega uh, there, uh, by omega, d omega, evaluated at uh, e k minus e. Okay, I call this z k to the minus one. Okay, so so that's this is this this object is is this. <coughs> now I want I want this square in the denominator, so it means I can write here uh, z k to the minus uh, two times omega minus uh, e k minus mu. Um, everything uh, square plus uh, sigma double prime square. Okay. Now what I do is I multiply by, by uh, z in the numerator and in the denominator. So what happens? If I do that, I will get uh, minus uh, zk here. The zk uh, to the minus two here is uh, disappeared because I multiplied by zk squared. And uh, I need an extra zk here because uh, I multiplied by zk squared, so I have the zk here. <coughs> and uh, I need the uh, z. Okay, everything square. Okay. So you see I have a Lorentzian here again. So this will be my my quasi particle. The width will be zk times sigma double prime. And uh, I have a problem. Why? Because you see, you remember that the integral uh, d omega over 2 pi of this, so the 2 pi disappears, integral d omega of this over 2 pi is equal to what? 1. Okay. Now I have a problem because the integral of a Lorentzian is equal to pi. So it means that the integral of this is equal to zk. Okay, so I violated a very important sum rule. So the way we get away with this usually is that we write plus some incoherent part. Okay, so what do we mean by this? What we mean by this is that <coughs> suppose that I write the A of K and omega. as a function of omega at this k uh, fixed. Uh, 
then uh, what happens is that uh, I have a, I have a quasi particle see so uh, let's put uh, this quasi particle above the Fermi surface here for now so this uh, quasi particle is some some wet hmm? <coughs> But now there can be some weight uh, elsewhere, right? So this is this is called the incoherent part, and that's the co co coherent part. The coherent means here that it's it's a it's a quasi particle, and you will see that when we are right at the Fermi surface, this will be this will go to a delta function at zero temperature without disorder. So it becomes really like a plane wave. So in that sense, it's co it's, it's coherent. Okay. If you want, there's some damping, but there's a, a small damping. I mean, it's just um, jargon if you want. If you want to call it this way, uh, there's nothing more profound than than just uh, what I'm telling you here. Okay. So this this thing is the quasi particle, and this. I mean, uh, this can can be here also. This is the uh, this is the incoherent background. <clears throat> okay. So uh, now. Uh, you see that I have assumed already, I should have told you. Uh, I have assumed, if I had this here, I have assumed that Z is less than one. Okay, if Z was larger than one, then uh, none of this makes sense. So one of the very important results that we find for this sort of quasi-particle formalism to be valid is that the Z, okay, is less than or equal to unity, and it's equal to one when there's no when there are no interactions, so the sigma prime is zero. So it means that the derivative here, this derivative, has to have a, a negative sign if we want z of k to be less than one, because that that gives the minus one. Okay. So let's write this uh, somewhere. So we need uh, z k less than or equal to one. And this means that the D sigma prime D omega is less than zero. So if we want this to be consistent, we need this. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes, question. Uh, so we say that the derivative is meant to be uh, negative. But is it the derivative for all uh, value or only at uh, ek minus mu? Uh, this point. Okay. But uh, well, uh, you will see what happens with this the the, uh, the Fermi uh, Fermi liquid. In fact, the momentum dependence of this is in general small. So it's a frequency dependence that uh, that's important. So. Okay, so so the plan here is I will uh, I will uh, we will try to justify uh, that uh, this sigma double prime can be small in an interacting Fermi system, and so we will see later there will be some calculations where I will prove that uh, the result I will find, uh, but uh, now I will give qualitative arguments for the how this uh, depends on frequency and why it is small. And then once we have a value for sigma double prime, we will use Kramer's Kurlig uh, to show that this condition is satisfied. Okay, so that's the plan.
Okay, this, uh, okay. I, I will not, uh, okay, this formula you can remember, but uh, what we really need is this. So I will write this. So for me, liquid, uh, so I'm, what I'm going to describe is so-called Landau Fermi liquid. So what happened is that the uh, uh, helium-3, uh, people found out that the helium-3 uh, behaved like a degenerate Fermi gas. Okay, do you know the interaction between helium atom and uh, so you see that it's relatively strong. Nevertheless, it you know had the linear uh, temperature dependence on the specific heat and various quantities that you would uh, uh, assimilate or would expect from a, a Fermi gas. Now, uh, first question: Why is helium three a fermion? Uh, because it has uh, three uh, three nucleon, so it has two proton and one neutron, and each of these nucleon has a spin one half. So it is a rather spectacular manifestation of Fermi statistics. Helium four uh, becomes a superfluid around the two two or three degree, degree Kelvin, but that the helium-3 becomes superfluid at millikelvin temperature. So if you look at helium-4 <coughs> around the, you know, below the, the super, superfluid transition temperature, I said superconductor, is superfluid. Uh, yeah, you have a superfluid. And the other one is just a normal liquid. Chemically, they're completely identical, right? So it's really uh, this little thing in the nucleus that make a difference. So Landau was trying to explain uh, this uh, strange behavior of liquid helium-3 that was strongly interacting because you knew what the van der Waals interaction and what the Leonard-Jones potential was between the helium atoms. Uh, uh, but it behaved like a, more or less like a Fermi gas. So what he noticed, and uh, this is where I have just qualitative arguments for now, is that suppose that you have uh, some, uh, some some Fermi Fermi sphere. I will not put stuff inside because it would be impossible to read. Now remember that this is the Fermi Fermi energy, right? So uh, the Fermi energy is always huge compared with the temperatures we are interested in at the surface. Or here we will consider instead of temperature, we will look at uh, frequency, we'll look at energy. So suppose you have a particle that is uh, above the Fermi surface, uh, you know, within this, It's in a shell of uh, width uh, omega. And uh, now it will decay, okay? But it cannot decay inside here because of the exclusion principle. So it has to decay outside here. So now it is, uh, it is uh, here. I should I should do it like this. <clears throat> so if this was a momentum uh, k, then uh, this uh, momentum here will be let's say k plus q. Okay, I put it should be vectors here everywhere. Now if if it loses energy, uh, it means that it uh, it can scatter an electron that's below the Fermi surface. to a place, well, same problem, this problem, this electron cannot go there, right? So it has to, it has to, uh, it has to go to somewhere here.
and you see that uh, <coughs> because of energy conservation, again, this uh, electron that's kicked out of the Fermi surface has to come from a shell that has the same, same width, uh, omega, yeah. Okay, you cannot give to this electron more energy than this one had. Is that clear? So, <clears throat> so it means that here we have a phase space restriction. That means that uh, this uh, has to find a final state that has uh, that, that is with th that has uh, energy over all, let's say, all ener possible energy, that uh, Fermi energy, it has only a small energy omega. And uh, this one here, it, this one was k plus two, I forgot to write. This one is uh, k prime, and this one is uh, k prime minus q, okay? <laughs> so you have a phase space restriction here, and you have another phase space restriction here. So it means that sigma double prime, the scattering rate, at, uh, at uh, zero uh, temperature and without disorder, the scattering rate, uh, uh, sigma double prime of K and uh, omega uh, will be proportional to minus some constant times omega squared. Okay, so when omega goes to zero, we are at the Fermi surface, there's no place to decay and the lifetime is infinite. So sigma double prime is zero. That's why we have a quality particle. Another way to see it is that you can assume that uh, this is a, uh, that this is an analytic in frequency. If it is an analytic function of frequency, that has to be the first term because we want this to be negative. If there was a linear term in omega, that wouldn't work. Okay, so we change that. <clears throat> now, why don't why is it that I don't have a momentum dependence here? In general, in a, if you're not in a you know in helium three, if you are in a, if you have a band, then uh, definitely uh, the uh, Fermi surface, the length of the Fermi wave vector can depend on where you are on the Fermi surface, but. Uh, uh, in this uh, simple, so, so so there can be some angle dependence, but the point is that <coughs> we are always near to the Fermi surface. So we can uh, write this as a K Fermi. Another way to say this is that if you look at the derivative of sigma double prime with respect to uh, zeta K or E K, whatever, hmm? If you look at the dependence on energy that comes from the not being at the Fermi surface, this is of order uh, sigma double prime divided by the Fermi energy. Okay. But <clears throat> so this is much, much smaller than this dependence. So that's why we, here I don't put a Fermi uh, wave vector. I mean, I don't put some Fermi dependence, but some wave vector dependence. Okay, now there are more, uh, for this, if you want, I mean, there's a, you can show that uh, this is a, uh, related to the scattering rate of two particles without uh, many body effects times uh, omega square over some cutoff uh, omega star square. But, uh, okay, this is a little bit heavy uh, uh, notation, so, so I will stick with uh, this. So in, in the notes, I, I, I work with this. <clears throat> so the last thing we need to 
check to see if you have a premier liquid. It's just that ZK is much less than one. Uh, not much less, but less than or equal to one. All we need to do is to check that this is satisfied. Now, <clears throat> how do I know whether it's satisfied or not? Primer's Koenig, right? Okay, if I know the imaginary part, I have the real part. So I can write that. Uh, okay, let me drop the this dependence now, just for to be short. So sigma prime of uh, omega minus sigma prime at infinity. Uh, if there's a constant at infinity, you remember, for Kramer's credit, we need to subtract it. So this is equal to integral d omega prime over pi of uh, sigma double prime of uh, omega prime divided, and that's the, I forgot the, the principal part, divided by omega prime minus uh, omega, and I need the principal part here. Okay. Now, if I use this uh, model here, it means that uh, I get that uh, this is equal to uh, the principal part of uh, uh, d omega prime over pi with the minus sign, and I have omega prime square divided by omega prime minus uh, omega. Uh, just a second. Uh, should we subtract the uh, uh, sigma double prime at infinity? Okay. Oh, very good point. I, I forgot to mention that. That's a very important point. Uh, you remember that we said that uh, in the harmonic oscillator, the behavior at infinite frequency was that of, of free particles. The same is true here. At infinite frequency, this has to behave like a free, uh, free particles. <clears throat> so, so it means that the sigma, uh, the the imaginary part of this, at infinite frequency goes to zero. Another way to say it is that there's no uh, nothing to uh, to scatter anymore. You're you're giving so much energy that the the, the particle just flies through. If you do the calculation, sorry, I forgot to mention this. I, I would have, <laughs> I have to get to it uh, there anyway. So if you look at sigma double prime as a function of omega, and you do a real calculation, uh, I mean, in the sense that uh, you know you, you work hard and you do some calculation, what you find is that uh, it does this. Okay, so it goes to zero at infinity this way and this way. And here it has the minus omega square behavior. And the omega okay. square behavior stops at some, some frequency. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, in fact, it's uh, just a crossover, so it's not so well defined. But uh, at omega star, the, the behavior uh, changes. Okay, and uh, and there's no constant term here. That's another important point. At zero temperature, without disorder, as I said, at omega equals zero, you're at the Fermi surface. There's no way to decay. So inelastic scattering vanishes at the Fermi surface. And there's no sigma double prime. Okay, th this here is very useful to do this uh, this uh, uh, integral. So in the notes, I have done the kramer skernig transformation for a model, which is like this.
and I don't even need to specify this function. I mean, not able here, all we want is the sign. So I, I will not be able to specify uh, exactly the, the value of the function, but uh, the, I will put rigorous bound and uh, show that the, the result is, uh, is fine. So in the notes, calculation is done for this. Here to uh, save the time and not be bogged down with the mathematical details and just get exactly the same result, we will do an even more drastic model, okay? So we do this model, okay? So we have omega square and then path, it goes to zero. So there's a sharp cutoff. They're definitely not realistic, but if we want to just see uh, the sign of, the, of this, it's uh, perfectly fine. So the way to go is like this. So what you do is that you subtract the omega square and you add the omega square. So if you do this, then you get a minus a principal part of the integral d omega prime over pi. And this times and minus this is omega prime minus omega times the omega prime plus omega divided by omega prime minus omega. So you see, I'm happy with this. So that was these two. And then I have plus omega square, plus, uh, no, minus. <coughs> minus omega square times the principal part of the integral from minus omega star to omega star. And here from minus omega star to omega star of um, one uh, d omega prime over pi of one over omega prime minus omega. So you forgot the gamma everywhere. And I forgot the gamma everywhere. <clears throat> okay. So, so, uh, so this piece here is minus omega square times gamma. And the principal part of one over omega prime minus omega, I recommend this exercise, you can do it, uh, is equal to uh, log of the absolute value of uh, omega minus omega star divided by omega plus uh, omega star. <coughs> So you see that as um, for uh, omega small, I mean, this is basic, there's no linear term in omega that will come from this. Because what we want here is the linear term in omega. <coughs> so uh, this integral d omega prime of omega prime will give me a term that's independent of frequency. And then the, uh, so I have some, uh, some constant. And that constant, if you want shift, contributes to shift the chemical potential, that, that's a detail. And then um, this uh, term here will give me minus gamma omega uh, times uh, this integral of a constant. So that's just uh, two uh, omega star. Okay. So uh, you see that now if I take uh, the derivative of sigma prime with respect to omega, I do have a minus sign. Okay, so the whole thing works out. Uh, by the way, I, I put in, uh, the, the old version of the notes is done like that. Yesterday, I put new version of the notes where I, do, I did this more general model, yeah. Okay. So if you want to see this uh, latest version, you just have to look at the latest version of the notes. 
Okay, so I'm essentially done. As, so all I want to show now is that the, there's a sharp, uh, at zero temperature, there's a sharp jump at the Fermi surface for the momentum distribution. So let me raise this. So you will see very often in uh, when you do a kramers kronig relation that even though in principle you need to go from minus infinity to infinity, it's often just the frequencies in the because of this denominator, the frequencies in the vicinity of the frequency omega you're interested in, it's the omega prime in the vicinity of omega that contributes most. <coughs> That's basically what we what we uh, have found here. Okay. Now, what do I mean by the momentum distribution? The momentum distribution can be uh, measured by Compton scattering, for example. I will come back to this uh, perhaps later. But the momentum distribution is just the expectation of C dagger K, CK. So it's the number of particles in momentum k, okay? If I have, uh, in the case of a, of a free electron gas, in the case of a free electron gas, I have that the uh, uh, n of k, which is this expectation value of C dagger K C K as a function of uh, K is just uh, this, right? T equals zero, no disorder. Okay. What happens in the presence of interaction <laughs> under the same condition? Well, this is, what is this? This is equal to a minus <coughs> a G of K a tau uh, equal zero minus, right? Because, uh, the, uh, the, no, plus, because a G of K tau is equal to the minus the expectation value of the time ordered product of uh, C K tau C dagger K. Okay, so when tau is equal to zero minus, it means that I have to put the C K here and I get rid of the minus sign because of the way the time ordering is defined. But now how do I compute this? The way to compute this, well, we, we have seen uh, how to do this. How to do this is to, to do um, um, a T times the sum over I K M of E to the I K M zero minus of G of I K N, but G of I K N is the integral G omega prime over two pi of A of K and omega prime divided by uh, I K N minus uh, omega prime. <coughs> but this uh, sum we have done when, it, when when, when it's equal to zero minus, so th this this whole thing here is just uh, T sum over I K M of E to the minus I K M zero minus times G of uh, K and uh, I K M. And there's no, no approximation here. The, the A can be anything. So 
this sum we have done, and what we find is that this is equal to the integral d omega prime over 2 pi of f of omega prime times a of k and omega prime. So you see, I need to get rid of the energy variable now. And as usual, the Fermi function is associated with energy, not with k squared over 2m or anything. <clears throat> so, uh, so what would this function look like now? I claim that this function will look like this. For a Fermi liquid, where this uh, jump here would be uh, z of k. Why is that? <clears throat> it's it's like that because if I look at a of k and omega, so let me plot. a of k and omega as a function of uh, omega. So below the Fermi surface, you see it goes like that and it becomes sharper and sharper. I'm changing momentum now. It's not just one momentum. It's Momentum here, another momentum, another momentum. You see what I mean? <clears throat> now, if I look above the Fermi surface, the same thing happens, right? I have something similar, right? Something sharp, less sharp, and uh, less sharp. So now, if I, um, you see that uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, thing here, which is which is not uh, not so sharp, can leak uh, on the uh, here it's really a delta function, but these uh, these things here can can leak on the other side. See, there can be some of the weight here that expands on the other side. <coughs> so if I'm a, if I'm at a weight vector that's right at the Fermi surface, if I'm just below, I have the delta function. If I'm just above. I don't have the delta function. And the width, the height of this delta function, the weight is z, okay? So that's why you have the jump of z. Now, <clears throat> if I look slightly below here, I don't have exactly one because when I integrate over, over frequency here, the Fermi function stops here, okay? The Fermi function, many pen. Okay, the Fermi function now is this. <clears throat> so the Fermi function stops here, but this can leak on the other side. So I, the, I don't get one when I integrate because it's cut off by the Fermi function. Okay, so that's why it's below. And here on that side, the same thing. If the, the this leaks on that side, then it means that even for wave vectors that are above the Fermi surface, you get some small non-zero contribution from the leakage. Yeah? And for, don't forget that there's also some, uh, some background, there's this incoherent part. Okay, so is that clear? So we see this beautiful result that the, the Fermi surface, despite interactions, survives in an interacting system. <clears throat> and as I said, this can be measured by, uh, uh, by Compton scattering. Okay, there is one thing I forgot to do. I knew I would forget something. It is the, uh, I forgot to look at the velocity <laughs> with the quasi-particles.
Okay, it will take me just, uh, it's already, I should stop now, but it, it will just take me uh, five minutes. So let me just uh, do it. Are there any questions on this? Because I'm going back to here, I forgot to do something here. Okay, I just want to know the velocity of these. Uh, the, so, so what all I need to do is to write uh, the equation, the quasi-particle equation. So the quasi-particle equation was that uh, omega, that was the solution of the quasi-particle equation, epsilon k minus mu minus zeta k <coughs> minus uh, sigma prime of k and e k minus mu, okay, omega equals e k minus mu, that, that was the solution, so that, that's equal to zero. Okay, that was the, the, that was the quasi-particle equation. I wrote it with omega and the solution at e k minus mu, so I, so I write it like this. So to find the velocity, as usual, I just need to take the gradient. So if I take the gradient of this, I get some velocity z k that's uh, renormalized, okay, because it's not the same as the non-interacting value. Here I have minus zk, which is the uh, the usual band velocity, if you want, the, the velocity without interaction. And then here I have two terms. I have a term that comes from gradients with respect to k of uh, sigma prime of k, ek minus mu. And when I write gradient with respect to k, I mean with respect to this k, with respect to that variable. But there's another term that comes from the gradient with respect to this, right? So I have minus uh, derivative of this with respect to omega of the sigma prime of k and uh, omega evaluated at omega equals e k minus mu. So I use the chain rule now. And now I have gradient, gradient of e k. So I have z k star equals zero. Okay. So that's it, that's the, ex the expression. I can isolate uh, the value of, uh, of zk. So you see that I have that the zk star zk star is equal to zk. Huh? Because I will put one minus this is is z minus one times uh, z k minus uh, uh, plus gradient with respect to k of uh, sigma prime and now gradient with respect to k means with respect to this variable. So in the case of a spherical Fermi surface, I can use again the chain rule and see that uh, this is the derivative with respect to the deviation with respect to the Fermi surface times gradient of zeta k that I called zk. And you can see this as an expression for the effective mass. That's another way to see this. Why can you see this as an as a as an equation for the effective mass? Sorry, the, the board is really becoming a mess here. An equation because for the effective mass because I write if I write m star z star at the Fermi level 
equals k Fermi is equal to m uh, vf. So that's uh, another thing I will prove much later, which is the so-called uh, Lettinger's theorem, which tells you that the the volume of the Fermi surface is not influenced by interaction. If it's spherical, it means that kf does not change. If it's not spherical, it can change shape, but it will not uh, change the volume of the Fermi surface. So, so that's a theorem that I cannot prove now, but uh, that uh, uh, yeah, that allows you to write this as an expression for the uh, for the effective mass. Okay, because you can write the you can write the ratio of the velocities of renormalized velocities is the ratio, is the inverse ratio of the effective mass. So you you see that. Uh, the velocity, forget this term for now. The velocity, the renormalized velocity is smaller than the bare velocity. So it's as you expect the interactions, the the need the, the particles move slower, the quasi particles move slower than they would otherwise. And uh, uh, yes, the other thing I want to point out is that for the mass, it's just the other way around. So the mass is heavier because of interaction. So there is a, if you look at this, uh, the section on the Fermi liquid, there, is, there are some other very detailed uh, results that are, that are a, little, a bit old, uh, but they're still comparisons with Fermi liquid. And uh, so you see that the fits are pretty good, but the one thing you can uh, notice on the fits is that instead of looking like uh, like peaks like this, uh, if you look at the experiment, uh, then what it they, it they look more like uh, like this. And, uh, so this sharp descent is the Fermi function. Okay, and this uh, spread here, this is not really Lorentzian. Is because sigma double prime is omega square. So as a real Lorentzian, it would be it should be a constant. Okay, but you will see that the fits are pretty good. Okay, sorry for the delay. Any questions? Okay. So I'm staying. If you have uh, extra questions uh, that you want to ask in private. And uh, otherwise, I will see you uh, next Monday, 9. Okay? okay. Merci. Bye. Merci. Have a good weekend.